Back in the 60s, Billy Thorpe was the hottest rock star we had. The protests of parents drowned only by the screams of adoring fans. OK, Billy, this is your chance to dispel once and for all all of the myths about your life as a rock and roll star. Oh, good. <laughs> yes or no, were there drugs? Yes. Clashes with the law? Yes. Trashing hotel rooms? Yes. You blew it. <laughs> <laughs> After nearly 20 years, there's to be no more dancing in the streets of LA for Billy and his family. He's coming home. And still the larrikin. So what would you say you have today? More class than us? No, still more ass than class. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I'm Richard Carlton. I'm Tracy Kiro. I'm Jeff McMullen. I'm Charles Woolley. And I'm Jan Avent. Those stories tonight on 60 Minutes. Quarter of a century ago, Billy Thorpe was our biggest homegrown pop star. Back then, 200,000 people would turn up to scream their way through his concerts. His hits dueled with the Beatles for number one. He was a cult figure, loathed by parents for his clothes, his antics and his influence on their kids. For the last 17 years, Billy Thorpe has been living and working overseas, away from his still loyal fans. Now that he's coming home for good, it's going to be a case of lock up your mothers. Okay, Billy, this is your chance to dispel once and for all all of the myths about your life as a rock and roll star. Oh, good. <laughs> yes or no, were there drugs? Yes. Booze? Yes. Groupies? Yes. Clashes with the law? Yes. Trashing hotel rooms? Yes. You blew it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a touch of grey there, but there's no mistaking that devilish twinkle. Billy Thorpe is back and doing what he does best, working a crowd. The Larrikin is home after almost 20 years on a flying visit that became a concert tour. He didn't plan it, it just seemed like a good idea at the time, but his first Sydney gig was in a suburban front yard. It's the same band, the Aztecs, and the same old Billy Thorpe. But today, the audience is decades away from Billy's heyday. Oh, I used to like it when they threw the knickers on the stairs, it was, <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> now, now they throw their wheelchairs and crutches. You know? <laughs> You don't feel like uh, it's a bit. You're a bit past it, or it's a bit past you. No, why? What? What's a bit past me? This. 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 Being a rock and roll. Rock and roll like sex, darling. You know, it really is. Tell me, Billy. Uh, <laughs> you enjoy it for as long as you can. You know? <laughs> Billy Thorpe was quite simply a living god to nearly every teenager growing up during the bandstand era. He danced the stomp. And it didn't really matter what he sang. Some of his biggest hits were crazy cover tunes where the lyrics hardly touched the imagination. There's one song from, uh, from that era that I think probably still stands at the top for the most uh, creative lyrics in musical history. Mashed potato. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> so just let me get it right. There were three words in the song, weren't there? Mashed potato, yeah. And I think mashed potato, yeah, was repeated a hundred and something times in the song. Right, so the verse was mashed potato, potato. Yeah, 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 that was it. And the chorus? Mashed potato, yeah, yeah. 
was it. When I listened to the original, I mean, the original by Rufus Thomas was like, mashed potato, yeah. And ours was like, mashed potato, yeah. Do, yeah, do, yeah, do. It's just ridiculous shit, you know. It's like wind up toys. Mashed potato, yeah. Billy Thorpe's concerts drew bigger crowds than the Beatles. As a 17-year-old, Billy arrived in Perth for this bandstand show and was savaged by thousands of adoring girls. There were kids crawling up the, climbing up the front of hotels. There were kids in girls in closets, under beds, in the showers, everywhere we went. It was that whole hysteria thing, kids chasing us down the street, tearing clothes off and, uh, you know, hanging onto the top of cars. One girl got really badly hurt because she jumped on top of a car and went round a corner and she spun off and went through a shop window. They all hit the stage at once and one of them runs at me and slides in her own slime across the stage and took my legs out from underneath me, you know. Did that feel like adoration? Oh, it felt like pain. Attack. <laughs> yeah, it felt like pain. It was pandemonium. What an, what an angel. Look at you there. Where did you get a suit like that? Now you that? know where Johnny Farnham got his whole thing from. Mm. Look at this. <laughs> Rock historian Glen A. Baker has collected decades of Billy Thorpe memorabilia. Billy, how can anyone possibly look that cherubic, that wholesome and well scrubbed? I was pretty, wasn't I? He remembers the cherub who in less than a year became a wild hippie flower child complete with an endless runway of one-night stands. My God, Glenn, where do you get all this stuff? Remember the Aztecs used to, in the Sunbury years, used to fly around in that, in that great private plane, that Italian troop transport? One of the planes we had crashed at um, Healesville, crashed in the mud, and we all ended up in the lake. I remember the roadie saying to me, come on, hurry up, we're on in ten minutes. <laughs> we're all in the plane going, oh. That's why most people I know think that I'm crazy. In the early 70s, it was a very hip Billy Thorpe who starred at Sunbury, Australia's version of Woodstock. For all his charm, Billy is still just a bit crazy. A bit like the rebel of the 70s, when the Aztecs always seemed to find themselves on the wrong side of the law and the locals wherever they performed. In Dubbo was one of these things, and after the show, the hotel threw on a, like a gala feast for the band, and, you know, one of the guys in the band pulled a girl and uh, turned out to be the mayor's daughter, you know, and before big we... Big mistake. Big, big mistake. Um, there were guys outside in, in pickup trucks with shotguns, and we were unceremoniously asked to leave the town and piss off and don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Was Dubbo the only place that happened? No. It happened, <laughs> no, it happened a lot. <laughs> in the midst of all this notoriety and success, Billy fell in love with a Melbourne girl, Lynn McGrath. And in 1976, they decided to give it all away to try their luck in America. I thought, I've just got to get out of here. I'm going to, go. I'm going to end up with a bow tie singing over the rainbow in Lee's clubs for the rest of my life. I've got to go, you know. So I did. I just went... Phew. How long did it take you to make your first million in the States? Not that long, actually. <laughs> <laughs> See, this one's the size. I'm very lucky. Yeah, absolutely. I've always been at the right place at the right time. What do you think? and the right place for the last 17 years has been Los Angeles, where the Thorpes have raised their family and where Billy still manages to raise a little hell. Yeah. So this is what keeps you young. Instead of buying suits and ties, you buy this sort of shit. Huh? And you act half your age. <laughs> Billy well, may be young at heart, but there are two reminders that he's approaching mouldy oldie status. His daughters, 16-year-old Lauren and 21-year-old Rusty. 
parents showing up in their leather jackets and their jeans and boots to like conservative school functions. <laughs> Because they went to private schools, you know, and a very like right-wing Republican, very straight Ivy League kind of people, and we turn up to the, to the to the meetings, and we're always just, you know, in a shiny suit that one time. <laughs> <laughs> to the father-daughter banquet, he shows up in this like shiny teal green suit. With... <laughs> See, there was a period where, when I had really long hair, they were embarrassed by me, you know. Why don't you get your hair cut? You know, I remember you saying me, get your hair cut, you know. And then, um, <laughs> then, uh, then as they got older, it became cool. He's cool again. I'm cool now. <laughs> no, but they've been great. Their friends love me. All my guy friends are in love with my mom, and <laughs> all my, and all, all the, the girls, girls think my dad's cute. Yeah. <laughs> Rusty and Lauren are Hollywood girls. Their knowledge of Australia is limited to holiday destinations, and everything they know about their dad's glorious youth has been gleaned from videos. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm crazy, you know? They hid his, Billy hid his old videos because they laughed so hard at him. <laughs> well, every time people came around the house, the kids would put the damn videos on. They had like groups of friends looking at me when I was at the, uh, singing, poison, singing ivy. poison Ivy, you know, and the two uproarious laughter, so I hid them. <laughs> I was a god, baby. And you were <laughs> my father the god. I was a god. Your daddy the god. <laughs> and they gave him that living legend thing. So that, you know. <laughs> living legend? No, <laughs> Hall of Fame. <laughs> Just call me Ledge. <laughs> yeah. I've never liked the sound of my own voice. I, can, I can't Kill listen on. to my own records. I'm dead. I mean, I, I don't. you know I like to talk, as you know, but... <laughs> Um, I've only started to enjoy the sound of my own singing in the last couple of years because I think my voice has matured and, and I can, I now, because it was all the same thing, that it's a man. Um, so I could never work out why I was as popular as I was, you know. Do you still have enough energy to do the stomp? No. Well, I, I'm, I don't really know what the stomp is. Oh, I'm not going to show you, Trace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, Come on, Dad. No, you do it. Yeah, come on. You show me how to do it, and I'll see if I can But remember. when you enlist on, three powerful allies... No, that's not it. It's this one here. The stomp. <laughs> I can't do it! <laughs> <laughs> Billy Thorpe might want to forget the stomp, but he can't forget Australia. At 46, after 17 years away, he knows it sounds corny, but he wants to come home for good. So many people come up to me in the street with fond memories attached to the various eras that, that I was a part of, and particularly records that I made. And, you know, my wife and I got married and, you know, we played this record or this, or this was playing on a jukebox when we met. And, you know, I mean, and I mean from politicians to to truck drivers. It's incredible. I, I've forgotten just how big we were and, and how many people we played to. And the first step on the long road home is, of course, a new CD collection. She's a woman in red, blue jeans. She's a gal that's queen of the tree. Which may just see the resurrection of the Billy Thorpe legend. the second coming of the Antichrist, you know? <laughs> I have to ask you about this album, and I haven't got um, the whole LP, just this little oh, photo here. The class. More asked We're wondering class. which one is yours, and our I'm guess is up. it's that one. Ah, you think I've got that tight little one, do you? <laughs> it is, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was certainly not the hairy one on the right. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say you have today? More class than us? No, still more ass than class. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Ninety-four has become the year.